Good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. Thank you so much to everyone who's continued to tune in during the hectic scheduling process we've had. I was on the road all of last week and a bit before that. Sagar had breaking point scheduling, so we had a decision to make. We decided we'd rather put out new content than take a pause until we could sync everything back up. Good news. On Tuesday, Sagar will be back in action. We're going to have an amazing episode with Andrew Yang. After that, we have another one with Bradley Tusk, Evan Osnos, and many other guests among that. For today, we're having a really interesting conversation that's continuing our focus on the American political system and revisiting a bit of the thought process we have around this actual show we're talking about here. So we brought back Aliana Johnson. She is the editor-in-chief of the Washington Free Beacon and her co-host of the podcast Ink Stained Wretches, Chris Steyerwalt. You may have heard of Chris because he was the Fox News political editor slash analyst who made the call to put Arizona in President Biden's camp in the 2020 election in November on election night, which eventually led to his firing from Fox News. So today's conversation is all about media state of it, what's good, what's bad, what do people in the audience that we're building here get right about it when they're critiquing the MSM, what do they get wrong? And then also there's a really great conversation about lessons from big presidential elections. This is all going back to what I said earlier when a commenter slash reviewer pointed out that we hadn't really come to an agreement about where we were to take the show as we started to push aside what we were thinking about how the system worked after the 2019, 2020 first season. So this is just part of that process. It's not quite clear where we stand on everything, everything's up in the air. But as Chris actually discusses during the episode, it's pretty clear more and more as we get further into this decade that basically no one knows what they're talking about. So we're going to get very comfortable over the next season, over the next year, exploring all these different spaces, but also trying to find time together to think about these things too. So as per usual, I will be in the comments section, leave me some thoughts. I would love to respond, including about how I could set my microphones, settings, properly. Please let me know how I did today. We can make to make it better next week as well too. Also, other quick note, if you want to get more original content, be sure to go to the Substack that we also post as well on Thursday afternoons, Eastern Standard Time. Let's get into the episode. Thank you for having us. Great to be here. This is an episode I wanted to do for a while. It's a little meta. We're going to be talking as media people about media, given a large part of the realignment and breaking points pitch is we're building something counter in media to many ways. Speaking with the two of you will be interesting, given the fact that as your podcast description puts it really aptly, the two of you love the news business, but you're deeply frustrated with a lot of what's actually happening today. So let's actually start with your backgrounds. I don't typically focus on that but about as much, but um, Eliana and then Chris, talk about your backgrounds and talk about your dissatisfaction with the space relative to all that. Sure. Um, I, let's see, I, my first job out of college was working at a New York newspaper, the New York Sun, which was fantastic, doesn't exist anymore. But I've worked in various jobs over the last 15 years in uh, television journalism at Fox News, in print journalism at National Review and at Politico, uh, where I covered the Trump White House, um, a bit with CNN um, as an analyst, and then uh, now I'm back to uh, now I'm I'm running a newsroom at the Washington Free Beacon, um, so I've had some exposure to the mainstream, a lot of exposure to um, reporting on the right, and I think what we wanted to do was there, you know, hating the media is like a reflexive talking point on the right, but. We wanted to break down kind of like how and why the coverage is flawed when it is and how that works. Like what are what are the mechanics of bias Well, or, I, or just bad coverage? And I think one, one of the things that— You guys don't know who Chris Dyerwalt is and you're listening to the realignment. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I'm, I have worked in the news business since I was 17. 
uh, and it is, uh, I love it. Uh, and I, as I say, you know, the day that I walked in to start being a sports reporter when I was 17, just finished my senior year in high school, I knew I had found my people. I knew that I was an ink-stained wretch. Um, but I, I, a lot of media criticism is opinion journalism or partisan politics masquerading it as something else. Uh, so as I, as I like to say, it is the first refuge of the scoundrel. I don't want to talk about the story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the coverage of the story. So it's easy for CNN to say like, well, did you see what, you know, here's this story that might be bad for Joe Biden, let's say. Uh, but did you see how Fox covered it? Well, what about what Fox did? Okay. Uh, media criticism, because of my experience and what happened to me and my, my firing at Fox and all of that stuff, I did realize that I had something else to say about this stuff. Spending 10 years. Uh, I tell them you were fired from Fox. I was fired from Fox after the 2020 election uh, and after there was a, a lot of upset among uh, Trump team members and supporters about our call over the uh, Joe Biden's victory in Arizona. But wh whatever the case, they don't owe me a living and I'm not mad. But I did know that that experience gave me and 10 years working in cable news gave me like a little insight that maybe some other folks didn't have. So our hope here is that this is not opinion journalism dressed up as media criticism, but as actual media criticism about what's right. And also, one of the things that people forget, so much of what's wrong with the press today is a reflection of bad inputs from the market side. Uh, we talked in, the, in our episode this week <clears throat> uh, about the Aussie media scam uh, that Ben Smith exposed and talked about how they were suckering investors and all of that stuff. The fact that people can't figure out how to make a profit doing good media work, right, the, that it's so hard to do, is going to give us a lot of what? A lot of bad journalism. So understanding the, me, the, the profit motives here and what all those inputs are, I think, are helpful for people to understand too. Let's push against <clears throat> audience assumptions then, what do you two think, assume this, the typical realignment slash breaking points listener is in their 20s, 30s, they likely don't watch cable news. What do they get wrong when it comes to media criticism, when it comes to their distaste for the industry and the space in general, especially the East Coast DC variety that the three of us practice? Uh, you mean what do what do folks on the right, like young folks on the right, get wrong well, about it? Well, just in, just in, and what's interesting, it's not even just traditionally on the right, because for example, look at the Joe Rogan audience. That's an audience that leans center right operationally, but they definitely wouldn't identify as I'm a conservative listener. But if you actually listen to the rhetoric that people like Joe Rogan use, people in the intellectual dark web, this is also the Barry Weiss category. It does lean that way, but I wouldn't say that audience identifies as conservative, quote unquote. What do you think um, is a is a misconception? Um, well, I mean, I, I think <laughs> I think nobody ever when they're 20 something years old wants to say, like, I'm a conservative Republican. Right. Nobody wants to say that. You say that. When I you're, guess I was the outlier. Well, very, very few, very few. Uh, but it sounds cooler when you say, like, I'm not into labels, bro. I'm outside. I'm outside of that construct. And, you know, I have a joke about Starbucks and the um, pumpkin spice latte. They don't care whether you're enjoying it ironically or sincerely as long as you're buying it. And I think for conservatives in America, this Rogan, uh, who else? Uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, there's, there's a Tucker Carlson adjacent community that is appealing to a lot of younger listeners. And they're at the intersection between news and opinion. And they're over in that space. Uh, and I, you're right. I'm sure they don't identify. They wouldn't say like I am a conservative Republican. But it's like I'll see you. I'll, I'll see your voting record in 20 years, and I bet I know uh, that you will be. But I definitely, I, 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 the idea that corporate established media is in the tank and not going to deliver uh, the truth is reasonable, well founded. I got it. Like, this is a, a earned opprobrium. And this is true not just among right of center listeners to somebody like uh, Rogan, but to Bernie bros, left of center, younger people who are watching the Young Turks or whatever, whatever they're doing. 
the conception among these people is that corporate media is not going to deliver the straight dope. And they're right. But here's the one that I think a lot of people forget. Somebody has to pay money to get the news, right? Someone is going to have to eventually pay Eliana money, and she ain't cheap. Uh, somebody is going to have to pay me enough money to, like, keep a roof over my head and send my kids, uh, you know, make sure that my kids are eating breakfast. Uh, this is all really, really expensive. So there is a bias toward renegade journalism. There's a bias toward outsider journalism with younger uh, viewers that I get respect and is well-earned. But I would just remind them, this is really good journalism is super, super expensive. Okay, Marshall, I think that gave me the amount of time I needed to think of an actual answer you to go. your question. Um this isn't necessarily something they get wrong, but it's like being 20, there's a lot of stuff you don't know. Um, I think it is, it's like a general skepticism of the New York Times, the Washington Post, blah, blah, and then an inability to distinguish between some of those outlets occasionally do really good reporting yep. and to say, that's a good news report and this is why. And that is uh, a politic, that is a partisan hit job vi- uh, in the parlance of like yes. reporting. And why is one this and the other that? Because, um, and, and frankly, like a lot of times I hear the skepticism from the Times or Politico or wherever people will say, like, is this trustworthy? Um, and not quite know how to figure out, like, when is something, when is something credible and when is it not? Yep. Um, which has a lot to do with sourcing. Um, the practices of the reporter in terms of asking for comment. Uh, and and then, like, another thing I was interested in is what I think they don't, there's not a full understanding of is how this is done. Uh, a lot of it is not intentional. Uh, yeah, okay, they are partisan and left-leaning and whatever, but our elite, so are our elite institutions. And I think people probably wouldn't be surprised, but, like, in these, in these, um, outlets, CNN, wherever, the challenge that it actually poses of like fairly capturing the other side when you don't know anybody or have a trusting relationship with anybody who doesn't agree with you, that poses like real challenge to doing a fairly reported story because on the one hand, you have the Democrats who are all of your friends and who you go drinking with. And on the other, you have Republicans who, you know, all you know is the caricature. And like that, of course, shows up in the coverage. Well, one, one thing that I think leads to uh, – so always remember the, the reporter's first bias is for conflict. Uh, there's no story unless there's conflict. Uh, the old joke is we don't report on all the planes that land. Uh, so the, the, fir- the first thing is good news is boring. And so there's a strong bias for conflict and bad news. So that's – but we've known that for – and that's always been true. Um, but the other thing I would say is, who works? Uh, Eliana is from the Midwest. She's from Minnesota. I'm from West Virginia. How? What percentage would you say of the people that you have worked with in big time newsrooms that were not from one of the coasts or from a big city? Very few. Very few. I, I promise you, I've I've only ever been the one person from Ohio County, West Virginia, that I bumped into uh, on the well, on the national media stage. But, yeah, I mean, but, they're from cities where elites live, and then they go to elite colleges, so and we know like what the average college campus is like, and then they go to so you're the from, elite institutions. You grew up in Bethesda, Maryland. You went to Columbia Journalism School, and you came out. You don't know. That you, you know, this is water, right? You're the two fish in the water. You don't know what, you know, what is what is this world that I'm swimming in? So other points of view are going to seem extremely foreign to you. And this isn't uh, intentional bias so much. It, I'll put it this way. We should not be surprised that big time national journalism is populated with liberal Democrats any more than we would be surprised that the energy industry is populated with conservative Republicans. Who wants to go into that work? Where do they come from? And I would say that conservatives who choose, who disdain uh, media, who uh, disdain entertainment, who uh, disdain uh, academia, are leaving that whole space for other people. So get in there. If you you want more conservative voices uh, in the media— Eliano will hire you. Uh, send us an application uh, at the dispatch. Get it, get out there and get in the mix. There's so many 
really great rabbit holes that we're going to be able to go down here. I want to start with the following, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you're thinking about this space, especially the fact that the two of you were, were talking about how there's coastal bias, people don't really see what's going on in the country or understand what's actually going on, which brings up the obvious trope of, man, after the 2016 election, every New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times reporter going to the mythical Trump diner in Ohio. Yeah, in no, some no southern breakfast part of the eater in West Virginia was safe for two years. It was very, you could not eat, you could not eat biscuits and gravy in public without having put somebody put a microphone in your face. So what's interesting there is it's now widely conventional wisdom that that whole pivot was cringe in retrospect. It was little, it was try hard. It was very superficial. It was performative. Yeah. So if I want to get it, so you're getting to the question I'm going to ask, which is what went wrong with that post 2016 project and how would that project be done the right way? Because given what you've all described, operationally, we're always going to live in a world where most of the media is going to lean center left for a variety of structural reasons. So separate the conservative publication, like what should a good faith member or a person at one of these institutions actually do if we can agree that paying for a travel budget to Ohio isn't it? It's a good question. One of the things I'm constantly surprised by is it's actually not the lack of knowledge of what the average, you know, hillbilly elegy character thinks and feels and what their problems are. Like, I think there's a, you know, a fair amount of understanding in the media of what's happening there, they just don't empathize with like the frustrations of, uh, you know, the hoi polloi. What I'm more surprised by is the, because these are mostly liberals, they haven't really interacted with or been challenged by conservatives. They view the right as a monolith. And like, I, you know, I'm at the free beacon and people constantly, it's like the free beacon, the daily caller, Breitbart. And there's no knowledge that like, these things are completely different. There's lots of disagreements between them. Um, and I'm just constantly surprised by the lack of knowledge of even what's happening in elite Republican and conservative circles among the mainstream. And I think that actually does come from like they're not hanging out with this isn't who they hang out with and chit chat with and develop trusting relationships with. And of course, like things things sort of flow from like the elites on down. But Oftentimes, and, and I'll give you an example, like I wrote a piece for Politico about, um, you know, Liz Cheney martyred herself and all the mainstream coverage was like, oh, my gosh, the Republican Party just can't tolerate any Trump dissent. Um, she's being tossed out because she criticizes Trump. And while that was true, yeah, what it was missing was like folks in my world were like, oh, you know. Liz, it's hard to do her a favor. It's hard to have a relationship that like her own friends were frustrated with her. She's not a very good politician. And what I picked up from talking to people was like, this is something she perhaps could have weathered had she like been better at developing alliances on the right. And I just found like that narrative, which I think is pretty interesting, totally missing from the mainstream coverage, um, which was fixated on like Trump, anti-Trump, because they're not talking to people who are Liz Cheney's donors or former donors or allies or, you know, are going to her to ask for favors. Like, that's just not their crowd. Well, and I, I would I would also point out we don't share one microphone when we record the podcast, I promise. Um, just for you. Just for, just for yeah. you. Uh, and I like that we're doing it like we're the pips handing the microphone, le leaning in. Um, we should have like a, a like soda – Whatever, so yeah. it's spaghetti. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, Lady and the Tramp, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so after the each presidential election is followed by received wisdom, which is then overinterpreted. So if you look at the front, if you look at the New York Times political coverage after the 2004 election, it will tell you. The Democrats lost because of God's gun, God, guns and gays and these red state NASCAR dads, same voters that we're talking about with Trump, blah, 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 and that this is the problem. And they've got to uh, – Democrats have got to get serious. They said we got to get uh, – Democrats are going to need uh, somebody like Mark Warner. They're going to need somebody like Hillary Clinton. They're going to need a moderate red state Democrat to do it. You know what no one said? How about the most liberal 
member of the United States Senate, a freshman with the middle name Hussein, said no one, right? Said no one. But the received the, the received wisdom in two, after the 2004 election was that. So you can go through each election after that, and there is a received wisdom that the, the political press is such a bunch of sheep. So they, they're going to they're gonna line up behind whatever it's like, ah, this is what it was. So in 2008, the story was very easy. Barack Obama is the messiah, and he is going he has come to lead America out of its backward racist terrible past. Uh, this trans- is You remember the debate. Is Obama FDR or Lincoln? I don't know. Can he be both? I guess so. So then we get to 2012. What is the story of 2012? Hispanic voters. Hispanic voters. It was all about Hispanic voters in 2012. In that case, you couldn't go to a Cuban coffee shop for your pastelito uh, without being assailed by somebody coming up to you. So after that's after 2012. After 2016, it's hillbilly elegy. So every time we get it, there's truth in it, and then we get it wrong, and then we overinterpret it, and then we beat it to death, and then people look back and go, that was dumb. Why did we talk about that so much? Marshall, I feel like we're out talking you here, but the other thing that I think no, is like for- endemic- No, wait, that's the format, please. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing I think is like endemic in this is these, in this like elite bubble of journalists, there are no costs for getting things wrong. And so there's like no, look at this Woodward Costa thing. Like they clearly, all right, so Bob Woodward, Bob Costa, they write this book. What it seems to me like now after hearing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley, testify under oath is that they they didn't lie. They omitted a detail that would have made the story less sensational, which is that he had civilian oversight, uh, oversight and approval to make these calls with the Chinese. That detail oh, is Oh, that's not- kind of important. Yeah. yeah, so that's important. It's just the omission of a detail that, like, made the story seem crazier. But their book will still be a bestseller. The Washington Post isn't going to toss them out, you know, on their— well, Michael Wolf has best-selling books, too. And I'm just saying, like, are they—what's what, the cost, cost going to be? Well, for uh, if if there, and on like Russiagate, is there is there any? Did anyone pay a cost? So the if uh, uh, we use the Jeffrey Tuman standard here on Inkstained Wretches, uh, if you can maintain your job uh, after pleasuring yourself on a Zoom call uh, with your colleagues, then you know, uh, okay, yeah. yeah, it's uh, the 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 it's the the soft bigotry of low expectations. Uh, I think uh, applies. But here, here are the the things you can always just define yourself down. So there's always a there's always a scummier part of the news biz that you can migrate to. What does happen, and we have seen it happen, is people who fall from super status. Think of what Bob Woodward has done in terms of his reputation over the past decade, right? Grinding out these books, these dumb books. Over and over again. Oh, please. I'd still rather be Bob Woodward than Eliana Johnson. I'm sure he's like 20 times as wealthy as I am. I'll, I'll trade places with you, Bob. Thumbs down. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to fudge the truth for enough money. I'm, I'm, I'm staying right where I am. But Bob Woodward went from being a lion, of uh, 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 this this guy who was an, an unimpeachable— he, I mean, Robert Redford played him in the movie, to now— uh, hacking it out, uh, putting up uh, his books every six months. The Twenty and thirty somethings who listen to this have no idea who Robert Redford is, but uh, Robert Redford was cool when it happened. He I was guess. he he was the he uh, nice would, sideburns. That's the way. Yeah, I quality yes. sideburns. I would say he was he was like the the apex wasp attractive guy. Is that right? He played the Great Gatsby. That's basically yeah. uh, Ape- apex wasp. <laughs> but like when wasp was like, that's a rather handsome man. That was who they. That's who they were talking about. So something I'm wondering about here, and this is where it plays into, Chris, I actually really, I loved the setup you gave around received wisdom, 2004, 2008, 2012, 2016, especially because there's deeper implications and we'll have a conversation about the conservative movement later. But if the whole idea in 2012 is, hey, everything is about Hispanic immigrants or just Hispanic voters in general, that leads the GOP to go down a path for right. a pathway to citizenship. That whole big debacle that leads to a variety of pieces, uh, mixing metaphors here, falling down. You see Eric Cantor lose to Dave Bratt. You see President Trump run run from the right immigration against Jeb Bush, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's talk about 2016 and 2020 within that context. What was right about hillbilly allergy narrative and what was wrong? Because I'll, I'll get to my answer in a bit, but I personally, and this podcast 
frankly, was framed around the wrong interpretation of that hillbilly elegy narrative. I'm curious what the two of your answers would be. Well, uh, I can I can say this. Donald Trump did not make my home state of West Virginia Republican. He did not make Ohio Republican. He did not make Southern Minnesota Republican. That's not what happened. These places were trending. So working class white voters have been moving right for 25, 30 years. You can make an argument in terms of the political alignment of the United States that starting in 1968, the migration of the white working class away from the New Deal coalition pushed out in the pushed out or pulled themselves out in the South over tension over civil rights. But in the North, when you look at the success of uh, George Wallace's first presidential campaign was in 64 and he goes up to uh, he goes up to Milwaukee and he finds all these Czech and Slovak immigrants are picking up what he's putting down. And he's not talking about segregation. He's talking about busing. Yes. But he's also talking about resentment of elites. And so you watch over 64 and then 68 when Pat Buchanan steals it, steals that mojo for Nixon in 68, and you watch the the movement of the white working class in the United States out of the New Deal coalition into Nixon's coalition, into Reagan's coalition, this stuff solidifies. The, the infantilization of poor and working class white people in the new nationalist right or whatever we want to call it in the United States about these people. Let me tell you, situation was not great 30 years ago, right? This is not something new that happened. It is um, deindustrialization combined with a weakening of social institutions that, by the way, weak social institutions hurt poor people first. They hurt the people who need them the most first. Uh, this, this breakdown has been happening over a long time. I see the 2016 election as fundamentally about the failure of two parties, which nominated the two least popular, least like candidates in American political history. The 2016 election was about the failure of two parties. Now, we can reverse engineer and explain why that was like how Donald Trump was the guy who came through that. And we can talk about how Democrats turn their back on white working class voters and what the consequences of that were as they embrace social issues. But I fundamentally still see 2016 as an election that reflects our two major parties failing and producing just horrible candidates. I think the question is like, what did the, what political interpretations of hillbillyology were right and which ones were wrong? Because the book itself is like a memoir that um, just is what it is. Um, And I think one of them was somehow that like Trump understands and captured like the anger of, you know, the, the working class or like, these are Trump people. And um, I'm not sure that that's that's totally right. I think to Chris's point, like the narrative that Republicans get it and Democrats don't like the elites in both parties whose job it is to understand the like the cultural transformation of the country completely failed. And that's like, that's for some reasons that I think the book does capture. I mean, this is like a tangent and uh, feel free to edit this out. But the thing that really stuck with me from Hillbilly Elegy, and and I I like to like when, when I recommend it to people, I recommend it with another book actually about an African American uh, guy who also went to Yale called The Short and Tragic Life of Robert Peace. Yeah. But J.D. Vance, the author, Ends up at Yale. Robert Peace, who's an African American from uh, the rough part of New York, um, those books really like captured for me that this is not really about race. That the barriers there are. um, So J D writes in in Hillbilly Elegy about going to a recruiting dinner with law firms, and there were all these forks and knives and different kinds of wine, and he didn't know like. Where does the for- where do I put the fork? And someone said Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc, and he only knew like there was r- white and red wine, and that was super memorable to me in terms of like um, the things that like come with like the privilege of the upper middle class that that di- these are like the cultural divides. Yeah. Um, so you can take a J.D. Vance who's a poor white kid and put him in Yale and that doesn't mean like these things are going to mesh. Robert Peace, um, this incredible book, it was like 
The kid, everything was going right for him and like the system worked. It got this brilliant kid from Newark to Yale and he ends up like back in Newark and he dies in a gang shooting. And it did like really bring out for me that the the obstacles and the barriers are like these cultural they're they have to do with money and culture um and not so much i think like the 2016 was very interpreted as being about race we'll, we'll at- and of course like there's overlap but these two books brought out to me that we the, the upper middle class like i arrived at yale and you know i fit right in because i'm from an upper middle class background and i knew like okay where the forks go and everything um but i just like didn't realize i think um just the cultural differences. Well, um, that's enough about your whiff and poofs. Maybe. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, know. Uh, I feel the, like that, the heart, that didn't the really make sense. Of Yale. But, the- but I did love those two books because it was like um, you can take the poor, the brilliant poor kid and put him in the elite and there's still going to be a lot of struggle and obstacles. We- and, and I guess I, they left me thinking like, OK, so what exactly can the government so, do about this? So, oh, what? No, I, I I was like, I don't know That's what the answer what it left is. You like, thinking, what can the government do well, about like, this? Is there Nothing any social? Well. Pro- yeah. So I was like, is there any social program that can solve worse. this problem? I'm sure the government could think of a way to make it much, um, much worse. But take J.D. Vance himself as a person. So he writes a book about how America's great institutions save him. That his that his grandmother's love and some support in his community. And then what's our best person what, what's one of the best person makers we have in the United States Military. the United States Marine Corps right you want to you want to make a per, you want to make a good person USMC not a bad way to go so his story is about how he through a love and support of a grandmother and a little support network finds his way into these institutions the institutions make him a better guy and he becomes a rich successful human being yay so it's this it's this rags it's a Horatio Alger story and it's really good and it's about how these institutions work What is he doing now to try to get into the United States Senate? Constantly attacking institutions, constantly tearing down institutions. He, funded by Peter Thiel, he, a a Yale-educated elite, he, a multimillionaire, this guy who had all of this success is now devoting his time to attacking those very institutions that made his success possible. And that is- Well, Chris, just to to push back a bit, and I'm not going to defend the way JD has conducted himself- on Twitter, but to the earlier part of our discussion, Eliana, you pointed out everything in our politics today seems to be about cultural transformation. Mm -hmm. This seems then to trend back to the reality that the upper middle class is the broad governing class, especially within these institutions. So the thing that makes the military unique is that that is not an institution that is dominated at a person level by upper middle class people. But if you're going to him going to a flagship research university in Ohio, Yale, venture capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if we're diagnosing culture and class as the central dividing lines in the country, it seems to make sense that JD would have his individualized story go on, but then turn on those institutions because those institutions are the embodiment of a set of values and persons that come from that background. And to the start of our conversation, those persons are not sent to right to conservative. So how would you respond? And I am way too defensive on, on JD's part here because I'm not particularly happy with him. But just, so, just to the idea of what we're talking about. The people, the to that people in those institutions want to be rich and successful and powerful. That's what the people in those, that's what those people want. Peter Thiel wants to be rich and successful and powerful. He is. He's really, really rich. And he did it. Um, here is my concern. The infantilization of working class white people and the treat the treatment uh, and this this goes into the heroin epidemic, which is real and disastrous and terrible. But there is a similar thing happening to working class with elites and working class white Americans, as happened during the crack epidemic of the late 80s and early 1990s uh, with black America and inner city America, which was these poor these poor people. And it's like, OK, yes. And then what and what do you want to do? And to you, to your to Eliana's point, which is, what's the government program that we're going to come up with to make Hodgenville, Kentucky, or you know, uh, Penile, West Virginia, uh, a, a a a place of flourishing? Is that a real city? It really is uh, a place of flourishing and enlightenment. 
Uh, what are we going to do to do that? And the answer is, and I hate to say this, but the truth is, these are cultural trends that have to burn themselves through in a large part. We should, as individuals, be loving and caring towards people who are – I. my heart breaks when I see the dope sick stuff about what has come out of the heroin epidemic in southern West Virginia and throughout Appalachia. When I, uh, I, I commend highly Kevin Williamson's work, uh, Big White Ghetto, talking about my part of the country and what people live through there. But that's different than then saying these people don't have agency and that these people are just victims. They're not just victims. Sorry, but who's – I'll let you go, Ayanna – who is actually? Let me let me just say something real quick. Here was my mistake about 2016. I thought 2016 meant that there were not a significant number of people who hold the perspective that you held. That is basic. You you are basically articulating a center right to libertarian perspective that Sagar and I definitely both thought was largely invalidated by 2016. But I think if you actually look to how the Trump administration actually unfolded, if you actually look to the policies, to the 2020 election, there's very clearly a serious backbone to the right that comes from your perspective. But the the pushback question that I pushed you here is, okay, like real talk, who's actually saying working class whites have no agency, right? Like, like there, there, there isn't, there isn't, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of this was done to X group of people. Yes. But I think to a certain degree, you can say, hey, the upper middle class professional PMC that runs our country's policies did not know what it was doing when it passed trade policies in the 2000s that went a certain direction. So that's not saying that a they white They didn't know class- what they were doing? Yeah. If like, listen, listen, trade, free trade didn't work? Well, well, this is the key thing, though. We're, we're talking about a very specific group of people. If you look to, once again, the rhetoric and the political case, the rhetoric and political case was rising tides lift all boats. It's easy to argue, obviously, in the aggregate that that free trade has enhanced this country, but there very clearly were communities that were left behind. And I don't think it's fair to say you're just victim blaming. Sorry, you're just sort of saying, go fix it yourself by, by pointing that out. Wait a minute. So are you saying I'm saying they should just go fix no, it No, no, no. Sorry. So, so sorry. Let me put it a better way. Pointing out that there were communities who are left behind because policies were passed too cavalierly without acknowledging downsides to specific groups who, once again, the specific sufferings of certain parts of the country can obviously be outweighed by the greater good. There was a bicycle industry and a horse industry that was wrecked when we could transition to the automobile. That's not the point I'm making. But, I am just but, saying, who is saying whites don't have agency? Like, that's, I, that's what I'm asking you. That, that, uh, I don't I, – if I specifically said that, that's not what I meant to say. I meant the infantilization of whites and we don't want to suggest that they don't have agency and that's not the right way to do it. I don't know of a person who said that poor whites don't have agency. But I have to say the idea that, that, you're, that you suggest that this is planned or that someone planned globalization uh, is not close to what happened. Globalization happened. Um, it is true that elites benefited from globalization and did not think about the downstream consequences for working class folks. But nobody made globalization happen. The invention of the shipping container and the change of China's economy, all of the other things that happened, nobody planned for that to happen. And I will promise you this. The people who now say that they can plan an economy that produces higher childbearing rates, when I listen to Josh Hawley and I listen to these folks talk about how they're going to plan an economy that's going to produce better outcomes, I'm here to tell you, nobody gets to plan anything. Both um, out people out of power and people in power overstate the power of people in power. We talk about social media now. Who likes the narrative that social media controls everything that we do most? Social media companies like this narrative the most because it says they are powerful. They are doing the stuff. I understand why working class white people from places like where I am from are resentful against elites. And I know that they have been resentful towards elites for decades. But the idea that this was somebody's plan or that this was orchestrated, I don't think hits. I don't think that hits anywhere close to home. Eliana, please jump in. Um, what occurs to me is there were uh, okay. You can isolate any group and say they were like the swing vote in 2016. Right. There are a whole lot of people uh, who voted for Barack Obama who then voted for Trump, and I do think there's um. We've we focused a lot on what's happening on the right, but I think that like part of this whole story is 
what is happening on the left and what is the response to that? And I have found that there's there's not all that much like self-reflection on the left. Um, though you, you did see it a little bit after 2020, not mm-hmm. 2016, about what is driving these people to vote for the other party. And I, I do think it is a product of, you know, wokeism and um, the – that, you know, there was like a lot of talk about, well, if we're going to have identity politics, like white people are going to have it too. Um, and I think their view is like, we should have it, but white people shouldn't, it, white people shouldn't have it. There's not a lot of self-reflection about the fact that like this wokeism, it's a super elite ideology that is alienating to the average person who is like, can't freaking keep up with pronouns. And uh, I do think that like, you know, the, the whatever, uh, who knows what the average person is like, looks at this and just thinks this is totally insane. I mean, Elizabeth Warren said she wanted her department of education secretary to be a trans student or something. I don't think that that's something that resonates just with the, um, you know, the rank and file person in this country. Um, I also think like that, on the left, there's been, uh, to me, like some of the increasing dividing lines. And it's not even left and right because there's like a section of the right that believes that is like on the whole, do you do you like this country and think it is a force right. for good in the world? Or it? on the whole, do you think like we do bad things and we're on the whole bad? And like, OK, this is a gross generalization. But I do think there that like the average person could say, oh, you know, yeah, we're, we've made a lot of mistakes. But like on the whole, this is a great country. We're the greatest country in the world. I think that like the left's increasing hostility to America, American history, like uh, as as traditionally conceived, yes, it had its flaws and oversights and whatever. I think that has driven people to the right because it's unnatural. Like to hate where you came from is unnatural. Um, and nationalism, like it's not all bad. It's also colorful to talk about out groups or uh, disadvantaged groups as opposed to the boring answer that explains almost every election in American history since the end of the Second World War, which is who won the suburbs. The the boring way to explain almost every election is the suburbs are half of the votes in every national election. It's about half of all of the votes. And guess what? If you win 53 percent of half of the votes, you are a good way down the path to winning. So you ha- it, we can you could break the electorate into any size piece of peanut brittle that you want to and talk about this group versus that group versus this group, the other thing. Um, The first bias of all reporting is story selection. We get to talk about what we want to talk about, and we don't have to talk about what we don't want to talk about. We want to hold journalists accountable inside the story, which is, did you do this? Did you cover this story correctly? Were you fair and balanced, if you'll excuse me, inside the story? But also, we know that story selection is the first and most important part. So after an election, who wants to go out and say, well, it turns out that middle class suburban voters did it again. They chose the president one more time for the for the 30th consecutive election cycle. Suburban voters made the decision. So we're also going to be drawn for something different. We want to tell a different story. And it's boring to just be like, well, as it turns out that people in the fourth quintile of income yet again dominated What's the America. Wisconsin like county. That Wauwato- I or no, Wauwato- Waukesha. Waukesha. No, I, do. I thought it was Wauwatosa. Yeah. Wauwatosa is where Scott Walker's okay. from, but okay. uh, the all, all important Waukesha County. So it is uh, the, the uh, sad news for everybody, except for da- Dave Weigel. It's always Waukesha County. My uh, main lesson for this podcast is that Wisconsin loves W's. W's, W's in front of names. Oh, and I right now can hear Reince Priebus saying, oh, Wauwatosa. Oh, from Wauwatosa. <laughs> I'm particularly proud of myself because I actually have a way that I can wrap all this together. This is going to be good. W- w- what's funny, Chris, is that despite our arguing back there, I don't really disagree with you on a policy level where – I would emphasize and rearticulate my point is where a lot of this matters, and this relates then to the press and to the 2020 question, which is I'm not arguing that there's a globalization is just this planned thing that was just done to people purely. But I do think when it's coming to the press, especially at the opinion level, I think that what people tell, the stories that are articulated, the stories that are focused on this goes to what was just yeah. asked, it really matters. So it did. So once again, on a policy level, the invention, like you said, of the shipping container 
pushes things in a certain direction. The fact that you can actually flatten the world to go back to 2000 era, you know, cliches, that actually does mean something if it isn't up to Josh Hawley or J.D. Vance or Barack Obama, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, those same stories, so the story that, hey, this is globalization, it's inevitable. It is very easy for that story to get mixed into discrete policy choices that folks make and then become a little too uncritical. And what I've found, and I'm curious what the two of you have learned from just podcasting in general, I guess it's the two of you, so it's a little different, but we had um, Joe Scarborough on the show and Joe Scarborough is great. People, people don't get him obviously, but he's a, he's a, he's an excellent podcast guest. Um, he gets the format, he hangs out, he's chill, but he specifically said, oh yeah, like I totally leaned too far into the idea that globalization was great for everybody. And now I'm much more skeptical of that notion. My takeaway from that story was that Joe Scarborough is the type of person who, as most people in media, is susceptible to specific stories and the mm-hmm. stories that are told impact the way they see things. So him hearing, hey, globalization is inevitable there's not really any discrete policy choices. This comes down to Luddites versus people who accept things as they are was not the proper story to actually get him to think critically about the moment. And you could argue that he and everyone else who read Hillbilly Elegy in 2016 is leaning too far in the other direction. But all I'm just trying to emphasize is that the stories we're telling here oftentimes lead to really bad conclusions, especially to take us back to the earlier part of the conversation. We are conceding that there's this upper middle class, professional managerial class that does not understand the country they live in. I want to be very clear on one point. I don't think anybody knows anything. I don't think anybody knows anything. I think voluntary association of individuals in the world do stuff. I don't think that it, I I don't think that it would have made any difference if Joe Scarborough would have thought about it one way differently or another. I think everything that you say is right and true that the received wisdom of the elites uh in the in the aughts, right? So through the first decade of the 21st century, the received, um, it was a mix of Fukuyama and Rui Teixeira. We have a demographic <laughs> destiny and we have a global, like, it's just going to happen, right? Can you, Tom explain, Fre- can you explain the emergent democratic majority? We haven't talked about that on the so show so it, far. In, uh, after the 2004 elections, when Democrats were soaking their heads and they could not believe that George W. Bush had won, Rui Teixeira, who's a good a uh, Democratic pollster, demographer, smart human. He and John Judas had a book, and it came out, I think, a little before. I can't remember, but anyway, at the moment where they said, we're doomed, we'll never beat the rednecks. The rednecks own us. It's gods, guns, and gays. We'll never beat them on the social issue because there's just too many of these people in the interior of the country. Because remember, Republicans look at the map and they say, look how red it is. And Democrats look at the map and they go, oh, my God, look at they're all still out there. They're all out there. This ocean of red is out in this country. They look at Montana and they get nervous. So their answer to that was, hey, don't worry. The country is going to get younger as the baby boom generation dies off, and it's going to get dramatically more diverse as especially Hispanic immigration floods into the United States. They were thought to have been proven correct in 2008 when Obama, a biracial Hawaiian, uh, shows and it's like, it's happening. The Republicans are dying. We're going to win. The Trump victory in 2016 was therefore extra horrifying for Democrats because not only was it did they lose to a reality show host with their quote, I'm making air quotes, most qualified nominee, blah, 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 blah. But not only did that happen, but it seemed to repudiate what uh, Judas and Teixeira had laid out for them about demographic destiny for the country. And this is now true for Republicans. Republicans anxious about immigration need to understand that all new immigrant groups, and this doesn't mean that the that, that having a good immigration policy, and I just want to be clear, I have no policy prescriptions. I do not encourage any policy. I don't- You're talking about the specific argument that right. like immigrants are going to be democratic. Right. Voters. Over time, what will we see? That there's only been one group, the Democratic Party, so defined by the struggle for civil rights, even to this day, Understandably, it was the hinge point. It remade the party. It changed the nature of the party. It brought black voters into the Democratic Party at an 80 or 90 percent vote share. 
the idea that they were going to replicate that experience with Hispanic voters coming from 30 different countries living all across in different ways, agricultural workers, blah, 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 blah that the Hispanic voters were going to function that way or that uh, Asian voters are going to function that way or new African voters who are coming into the United States in larger numbers. They're going to be like other immigrant groups of the past. The longer they're here and the wealthier they get, the more they will be susceptible to Republicans who are like, how would you like to keep more of your money and how would you like to have fewer regulations? Eliana, a question for you to build off of that, though. I have to do my audience advocacy for the more right populist listeners. They would say, that's a fine story, Chris, but you referenced wokeism. You referenced, you know, we're, we're, we're talking, we're talking in the context of the 1619 project. The right argument to Chris is, yeah, that works in a country that isn't being hyper-racialized and there isn't this broad project to prevent that from happening. So I'm curious how you, having brought up wokeism, think about the dynamic that way. Uh, I think that's an interesting argument. And um, I think you can think about, you're you're stipulating like this is all going to be a success. So if we successfully teach kids in schools, like, you're brown and you're orange and you're yellow and those things correspond with the political party. Like if that project moves forward unobstructed, sure. But I think like that project is driving as many people into the arms of the right as it is like convincing, uh, you know, impressionable young people that they're a member of some particular tribe. And so they have to vote Democrat. And I think like this is a little off topic, but what struck me about 2016 and being like in the conservative world and on the right was like, that the elites like the Paul Ryans and the Mitch McConnells and these people, um, they for two decades had emphasized tax cuts and budget deficits like Paul Ryan was famous for these slides that showed the debt and whatever. Their assumptions about what was driving voting behavior, I think, were fundamentally fr flawed. Right. And those assumptions lead to policy like, OK, so we should embrace free trade because of this and that for the budget. And we you know, there might be a lot of good reasons, but. When I think Trump was able to show if the received wisdom from 2012 was like Republicans need to do immigration reform, Trump was like, no, your voters actually don't want that. And your voters actually don't care about cutting entitlements or cutting taxes. They care more. Uh, they're more socially conservative than economically conservative. And the posturing of the Republicans before that had been like, well, we can't touch gay marriage or immigration. Like, that's just going to scare people away. And we just have to talk about, like, putting more money in people's well, pockets. I, and I think that was, like, a fundamental misunderstanding on the right that drove a lot of policy I agree. for the I past, agree. like, 20 years. I agree 100 percent. One of the problems that conservatives had was that they were victims of their own success, right? Uh, so successful had conservatives been in transforming, and this is, and here I'm talking about, if we were to look at the United States, 1976 to 2006, the conservative project, and nothing illustrates it better than the fact that the only Democratic governor, right, or the only Democratic president that breaks through is who? A, uh, a guy who, who flies back to Arkansas to oversee the execution of a developmentally disabled man from the primary trail, just so people black know. Black man, black yeah, man. That he, that, yeah, that he's tough on crime. Um, the Here is what conservatives who were so successful uh, after Reagan and, and through Gingrich Revolution, all this stuff, small government, lower taxes, all this stuff. They thought conservative ideas were popular, and they are not. The, the reason that there had to be a whole conservative movement built up at, in the wake of Barry Goldwater and all of that was that conservative ideas, people are, they're not popular. You know what's popular? Free money. Super popular. People love free money. They love it all the time. Shoot it out of a cannon. Over, if, if we were to do a poll question and say, do you think we should fly the Goodyear blimp over the country and drop sacks of 50s out? People would be like, I don't know. I like that guy. He makes a good point. The Is that true? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Is that true? I'm not sure this is true. I'm being facetious. Well, the, but, but, I, I don't really think the blimp question, because people well, would have concerns about where the money hit. Okay, that because well, that's that's just, I couldn't tell if you were being facetious or not, because the interesting test that we're seeing is- you I don't do even have, have a blimp. Yeah, so, and, well, because you just do have, you do, like, I guess I guess the way to ask the question then is, if this is, if this is all just about free money- No, no, why, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, so- no. So, here's the thing. The correct place to be if you want to get elected nationally in the United States is fiscally liberal and socially conservative. Okay. It is to be a New Deal Democrat. The, the Donald Trump was trying to, and now the, the populist or nationalist 
section of the Republican Party is trying to recreate the New Deal coalition. And when Josh Hawley said, here's what we ought to do with the jobs lost through COVID, we're going to we're going to save them all. We're just going to cut checks for every job that was lost through the whole time. Of course, that would be popular, right? Of course, that would be popular. When we survey, when we do survey questions on what do you think about Biden's plan to spend a quadrillion dollars, people are like, I dig it. When you say, what do you think about plans to change Social Security uh, and Medicare in the future? I don't dig it. I don't like it. People want, they want Robert Byrd. They want a social conservative who is preaching that old time religion and the old values that make sure that they know that they're still comfortable. What about the guy who just won in New York, Eric Adams? I'm tough on crime. I'm a traditional values kind of guy, culturally conservative. This is what the European right is, right? It's fiscally permissive, fiscally liberal combined with uh, a social conservatism. That's this, uh, you know, why did no one but some Guamanians vote for Mike Bloomberg because that <laughs> quadrant, right, the, the quadrant where a lot of people in the media elite live is what? Fiscally conservative and socially liberal. That's the emptiest quadrant, right? That, that's, where the, that's where the fewest voters are. The challenge for conservatives in th- inside the Republican Party is they now realize, oops, <laughs> right? Oops, uh, what the what the populists have is really powerful, right? And if it can win elections, then the conservatives, then Liz, Ch- it, it won't matter how many friends Liz Cheney has because the conservatives will be out on their ear if the populists continue to win. And 2022 is going to be an enormous uh, directional, it, it will set the direction for the Republican Party Going into twenty, so. you don't think so? Twenty twenty two is just opposition to to Biden and the Democrats. Twenty twenty four, I think, will be a little bit more interesting. Although that's still just like rallying. But if jo- I'm saying if Josh Mandel or J D Vance wins in Ohio, right now, then the question is if you if if one of those two can win the Ohio primary and beat Tim Ryan, the inputs for the Republican Party going into twenty twenty four, like it works. Totally. Do the whole- Oh, total disagree. And this is where I was hinting at the realignment thesis changing a bit here. Okay. If JD beats Josh Mandel, it's not going to be because he had, he talks on the trail about raising taxes on rich people, because that is the part of JD's campaign, which is most, which he was closest to your New Deal Democrat thesis. But I don't think that's what's going to cause him to win. If he's going to win, it's going to be because of the more culturally directed parts there. That's the social reconciliation no, part agree. there. I agree. But, but, but I guess that's my point. But that's just why I'm saying operationally, none of this stuff is going to end up as a reflection on whether or not that New Deal Democrat. Here, basically, here's here's what's interesting. Here's the better, way, the better way to put this thought here. And this is what, frankly, I just discovered through not just me, but other people through doing this, which is. The current culture war class polarization basically ruins the test case theory of does the economic populism work? No, 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 no. I'm not saying whether the I'm saying what will the inputs be? So if, let's say that you are, uh, let's say you're Ron DeSantis mm-hmm. and you're getting ready to run for president. You're looking for how you're going to make your run. Um, am I going to run as a culture warrior who is also an economic populist? Right. Because populism is not about ideology. Populism is just a, a, a way to be. It is a se- it is a grievance oriented politics. We're screwed because of something somebody else did to us. That's what populism is. And, and for the left, it's usually economic. And for the right, it's usually cultural. And that's just that it's a, it, it's not an ideology unto itself. It's, it's a methodology. So Ron DeSantis looks at what happens in 2022. It doesn't matter whether it's Mandel or Vance. My point is, do they beat uh, Tim uh, Ryan in the general election? So when 2022 is over, Republicans looking at running in 2024 will decide what kind of candidate they're going to be based on what the inputs were from 2022. If MAGA Republicans win and get elected and go into the Senate and they will say it works. If MAGA candidates get nominated and then lose in the general, guys like DeSantis will say, I'm going to hedge away from that stuff. On the other hand, if normos, if traditional Republicans get nominated, you, you see what I mean? The permutations that will come out of that. Again, I am not talking about policy. I mean, what will these candidates, the, the simplest way I can put it, in 2018, Democrats won their biggest victory in the modern era, right? They won 40 seats, four, at 41 seats. They have the smashing midterm victory. They do great. What do Democratic politicians think happened? They thought that the dawn of Democratic socialism had come. 
Bernie Sanders had to fight them off with a stick at the unveiling of Medicare for all. Kamala Harris is like climbing through the window to come in and say, like, I also want Medicare for all. The Green New Deal is fantastic. And then six months later, when voters said, I don't think that's what I want to do. And that left old Sleepy Joe hanging out by himself with Amy Klobuchar in the center left lane. And they had called it right. But the politicians had, thanks in part to Twitter, had got the politicians, thanks to Twitter and the political press, had received the wrong inputs from 2018, which set them up wrong footed for 2020. That is the perfect pivot to the last question. We'll start with Eliana. What are the- Oh my gosh, Marshall, I was going to say, I'm like punded it out. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, it's Recording cool. our cool. podcast before this and then doing this. Uh, yes, hit me. We Yeah, the last word. What are the bad and good inputs from 2020, the aftermath that the audience should think about as they're coming to their own conclusions about this episode? Um, I think that the the good inputs are a reframing of like where the Republican voter is and a, re, uh, you know, a more accurate understanding of that, particularly when it comes to immigration policy and economic policy. Uh, it's like, even if you're going to diverge from that, it helps to know what the reality is on the ground. The bad inputs, I think, are that Trump showed, and now like we're seeing elsewhere, that character and personal conduct and, and all that like doesn't matter. You can do and say whatever. And um, I believe that to be true. I just think it's a bad thing for the country. Um, and I think you're seeing this, like we just talked about CNN and Chris Cuomo. They're just like, okay, well, you know, Trump survived, so we don't have to say anything. And like, we can keep this guy around. Um, and I do think that there's like the new view among the elites is like, we don't have to conform to norms of like, you know, don't sexually harass people and don't curse and don't be revolting, like in a lot of the ways that Trump was. Um, but I think it's good to have like constraints on human appetites and behavior that we probably won't see in our politicians because of the input George, from 2020. As George, as George Will said the other day, uh, he's, we call it civilization. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Were you talking about men wearing jeans? He was talking about, yeah. he was talking about denim, but just generally. Yeah. Uh, Matt Lewis said, you know, isn't that suppressing? He goes, I'm in favor of suppression. We yeah. call it civilization. Uh, I Donald Trump never want to suppress. <laughs> never to want suppress to suppress. a word, an appetite. But, but, uh, but. A seven deadly sin. I, I, I think. What Americans, what we have to remember is people who are ideological and think about the kinds of questions that we've been talking about here today are not persuadable voters. They've already thought about these questions, right? 80% of the electorate every cycle is already determined. Uh, intensity matters. Do you get more of these, more of those? Picture the fact that there are millions of people probably who voted for Barack Obama and Donald Trump. Those people did not change their opinion. They did not change the way that they felt about things. What they said was, I'll vote for change. I'll vote for something different. I want to try something different. The most important question in 2016 that explains the 2016 election, is all, it's, this is always the key question on every exit poll or voter analysis, is this. Cares about people like me cares about people like me. Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump. Not really Trump. giving off those vibes, Hillary. Right. She lost on that question and Biden won on that question. For persuadable voters, for that governing third that is a, a little bit at least up for grabs and especially whether or not they're going to turn out, maybe they stay home, maybe they're a weak Democrat who doesn't go out for Hillary, maybe they're a weak Republican who doesn't go out for Trump. But those voters vote for people. They don't vote for policies. They don't vote for platforms. Donald Trump didn't even have a platform. They don't vote on issue sets because they assume that politicians will lie to them and that politicians will fail to deliver on their promises. What they do is they vote for a person who they think is the most trustworthy. George Bush beat John Kerry, not because people thought Iraq was going great. They voted for George Bush because they thought that John Kerry was a goofus so, and that George Bush seemed more trustworthy. So it always, it, it, it's always a person more than the policies. With that dunk on John Kerry, we Sorry. will take, we will, this is a very pro John Kerry podcast. <laughs> uh, we, 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 yeah, that's what we're known for here. We will leave it there. Eliana, Chris, thank you so much for joining. Any quick shout outs to any, obviously people need to take, check out Ink Stained, Wretches, they need to apply for jobs at the Washington Free Beacon and the Dispatch, anything else people should check out. 
Uh, Emmy Squared Pizza. This this episode brought to you by uh, Washington's Emmy Squared Pizza. It's the best, even if you just peel the cheese off. <laughs> I just am grateful to you for having us on. I don't need to plug anything. There you go. Um. Yes. Suck up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>